Historians of Reddit, what misconception about history drives you nuts? As I've started to look more into my local history Nebraska, it's crazy just how brutal the plains were. You had Sioux and Pawnee slaughtering each other, white settlers and cattlemen from Texas slaughtering each other, and of course all the interracial violence. Also pretty frustrating how shallow our study of local history was in elementary through high school. There was so much cool stuff that happened that I didn't learn about until I took a history course to fill out my hours this fall. This is a bit specific, but the notion that 18th century European warfare was waged the way it was because people were stupid, you know, lining up in a field and shooting each other from 100 yards or less. The military minds of the day weren't mouth-breathing simpletons who were incapable of coming up with anything better. These tactics were well thought out and highly effective when done correctly. I've gotten a lot of responses and questions about this. Basically, the deciding factor in most battles was the cavalry. The cavalry was highly effective against unorganized infantry but it was useless against organized and disciplined infantry. Both armies would deploy their infantry in dense lines to deter the use of enemy cavalry. In order to make their own cavalry useful they would attempt to disrupt the enemy infantry formation by shooting them apart and disrupting their formation enough to bring the cavalry in. There was some more complexity to it but this is the general overview. Until technology advanced on a large scale these tactics were sound. Not a historian but Martin Luther didn't set out trying to destroy the Catholic Church. His 95 theses were meant to start a discussion to end corruption in the church, and it kind of snowballed. Till Martin Luther was anti-Semitic. My priest was just discussing this the other night. Martin Luther tried to have counsel with the Pope Cardinals on several occasions before this even happened. Basically, he said Martin Luther probably would have ended up as a sin and the Protestant reform may have never happened if the higher ups wouldn't have ignored him. That Caligula was mad. Given what sources from the time we have it's unlikely he'd be sent to an institution, but he had a sarcastic and sadistic sense of humor that wasn't the norm for the time. Also he didn't make a horse consort consul. Consort's consul were elected and not appointed. Our sources from the time says that it was a my horse could do a better job than you comment. That's the problem with many accounts of emperor's lives. The more juicy stuff like making a horse a consul, or waging war on the sea, are usually described in the writings of political opponents or the Roman equivalent of gossip magazines. And even seemingly ridiculous stuff like waging war on the sea sometimes has a plausible alternative meaning, like punishing unwilling soldiers. There are a lot of myths about photography that bug me that people perpetuate. Not every weird looking photo from the 19th century is a memento mori, that is, post-mortem. A lot of photos floating around on the internet labeled as such are actually living subjects. And only in the earliest days did photographs take a long time to produce. By the Civil War exposure times were rapidly becoming comparable to modern cameras people didn't smile for photos because they thought it made them look foolish. Portraits were supposed to be serious and formal. The delegates who attended the Constitutional Convention spent much of their time drinking. One surviving document is a bill for a party on the 15th of September, 1787, two days before the signing of the Constitution. Items on the bill were... 54 bottles of Madeira, 60 bottles of Claret, 8 bottles of Whiskey, 8 bottles of Cider, 12 bottles of Beer and 7 bowls of Alcoholic Punch. All of this for 55 people. That Roman soldiers were paid in salt. All of them. Just thanked for their bloody, violent work. Told to sheath their little swords. Shown a cart's worth of fricking salt and asked to hike the heck out of there. The only real source we have for that is Pliny's history, but he's only talking about a single linguistic link, with no evidence to back it up, and he wrote hundreds of years after the fact, and even his quote is often misquoted. Dang it now I'm mad about salt all over again. I guess you can say, you're salty about it. Marie Antoinette never said let them eat cake when she was told French peasants didn't have any bread. That was 100% revolutionary propaganda. Contrary to popular belief, she did give some fricks about her people. Yes, I know the original quote used brioche and not cake. I can't help that the popular and pervasive translation uses cake. This is extraordinarily annoying. As I recall, the quote came from an anecdote in the confessions of a man who doesn't even name the source. 
other than to say a princess said, and yet it's now a widely recognized fact that these were her words. Napoleon wasn't short, it was English propaganda, picturing him as a short man to make him unimpressive. I read he would be around 1m70 in height. This isn't tall, but it's certainly not short either. For that period, that was even above average. This was also due to a difference in English inches and French inches, which the English were more than happy to forget as to portray him as a short man. Same with Hitler, he was of average height. He also didn't have brown eyes, they were reportedly intensively blue, and it's highly unlikely that he only had one testicle which a lot of people claim. I see this on Reddit a lot, that if a notable historical figure was less than perfect, then it somehow invalidates everything they did. For instance, that MLK may have cheated on his wife somehow negates his accomplishments. A good act does not wash out the bad, nor a bad act the good, each should have its own reward. I think in general history tends to take the emotions out of an event. We look back at a historical event and think oh my god it's so obvious. However for people experiencing fear, uncertainty, and not knowing how things will end we lose a lot in history. And how slow information was. We see protests and wars happening across the world in real time. They often had to take action on a few rumors, weeks later. That the time we live in now is normal and stable as opposed to back in the day when everything changed every few thousand years. We're living in one of the most fast paced revolutions in the history of mankind. People have been born before television and grow up with an established internet. Historical breakthroughs are happening on a regular basis. We're sending people into space for the first time. Almost all the people who invented things like the internet, video games, computers, Things that are going to stick around with us for the rest of humanity, are still alive. It's insane. That in World War II Polish cavalry charged German tanks with sabers and lances only to be mowed down. Didn't happen. Poland used cavalry, but mainly as a form of mobile infantry. They did in fact use a charge tactic, but only against enemy infantry, and that with success. The rumor that they charged against tanks came from a battle where Polish cavalry charged German infantry, dispersed them, only to be ambushed by armor cars and retreat. An Italian reporter, brought in to see the aftermath, saw the dead horses and made up a story where the cavalry charged tanks with sabers and lances. There weren't even any tanks involved at all. Yeah, you can trust the Italians to make crap up. Fun fact, Germany had far more horses in its army than Poland did. The notion of horses and lances charging the Wehrmacht was pure Goebbels propaganda. There actually was color photo back in the old days. It's just that black and white was cheaper to mass produce and much more to simpler to process so color was extremely rare. That people didn't know the earth was round till recently. We've known it was round for thousands of years. Hexam even calculated the size of the planet with some accuracy. So many scientific discoveries are attributed to the wrong people and many others are disregarded. What's really interesting is that Columbus had trouble getting financial backing not because they thought he'd fall off the end of a flat earth but because they rightly calculated that he'd never have enough food water to make it all the way around. The earth to India. How the French military at the butt of so many jokes about failing. Yes I get that they needed help during World War 1 and World War 2 but if you look at their victories compared to their defeats it is scary impressive. Amateur historian but what always bothers me the most is the idea that people in prehistory were somehow dumber than we are today. The truth is, their physiology and their brains are exactly the same as ours today and they were capable of the same complex thoughts and accomplishments that we are. It pisses me off when bulls documentaries claim aliens built ancient structures. People are capable today and they were capable then. They found a way. That a majority of Germans voted for Hitler. The most he got in a free election was around 1 stroke 3 rd share of the vote. I've had arguments about this with people who simply cannot accept this, including my sister-in-law who almost attacked me, called me a Nazi, and we've hardly spoken since. On the topic of puritanism in the colonies, popular belief is that alcohol was either a strong taboo or completely forbidden. This is 100% false. Popular belief that puritans believed in repression in bed, possibly to the point of the missionary style only for the purpose of procreation. 100% false, with a couple of minor qualifiers. 
popular belief that Puritan belief in witchcraft was a major issue. The fact that Salem stands as such a stark outlier indicates that this is false, and that Salem was plagued with over two decades of every argument turning into a turf war points to other problems within the town. A popular belief that anything fun was forbidden. This depends on your definition of fun, but there was a particular code for determining whether a certain type of recreation was permissible. Plenty of recreation was permissible and encouraged. Popular belief in the Der Puritan, which is refuted by nearly every bit of original source material. Popular belief in a unified Puritan theology, which is totally false. There was no unified Puritan church, and plenty of churches embraced a different type of theology than others. Look at the century-long argument over church membership. Popular belief in a Bible or nothing education for Puritan children. A simple glance through the libraries and catalogues of even common people shows this to be an outright fabrication. Even the ministers, who had theological training, were well schooled in the classical scholars of Greece and Rome. Popular idea that there was a promotion of willful ignorance for Puritan children so that they wouldn't think for themselves. The fact that both universal literacy and compulsory education was mandated by law seems to refute a smith as well. Agriculture didn't happen because we wanted bread. No. Bread is an afterthought. You leave the Garden of Eden of hunter and gathering societies to hunker down to grow the ingredients for beer. I like the theory that we domesticated humans. It's a stretch, but a fun one. I'm Scottish and I have a degree in history. And what really grinds my gears is the reverence some people have for William Wallace. He wasn't a hero. He was a criminal. A murderer. An outlaw and a thief. He didn't lead an army. He led a ragtag group of fellow thieves and such that gathered infamy and popularity. Yes, he won at Bannockburn. But that was rather down to English stupidity rather than good strategy on the Scottish side. He didn't really care about Scottish freedom. He was simply looking out for his own interests as he had upset some Englishman or other and he was in trouble. Robert the Bruce was a much better leader and fighter and actually won independence for Scotland. But no. Everyone believes the trash pile that is Braveheart. I'm bitter. Not Bannockburn. The Battle of Stirling Bridge. Oh no. He didn't actually even win at Bannockburn. That was a few years after he died. Robert the Bruce won that one too. Cleopatra wasn't some promiscuous ruler who slept with literally anyone. She was an incredibly cunning political genius who really only slept with two men as far as we know. The portrayal of her in the new Assassin's Creed game is incredibly incorrect and the only reason people view her as this promiscuous person is because of a decent slander campaign from certain Roman leaders against her after her death. Yes, she was by all accounts extremely charming, but when you read about Roman historians talking about her fellating an entire legion in one night, it should be pretty clear they're not being entirely accurate. That people in olden times all got married at 14 and started popping out children immediately before dying at 30, and someone who was 50 was considered extremely elderly. Average age for marriage has varied widely based on the region and time period, but looking back at Europe in the renaissance through to about the industrial revolution, average age of marriage for women was right around around 20, which is still young for today, but not the child brides people like to picture. For men it was slightly older as well. Early to mid 20s was common. Certainly very young marriages happened, but the view is heavily skewed by what people learn about in history class. The Princess X was betrothed to Prince Y of XY, Z at the ages of 3 and 5 respectively and married at 9 and 11. These were marriages intended to solidify national bonds, rather than marriages intended to solidify family commitments and create a unique nuclear family. Age at marriage is heavily dependent on the region and economic circumstances. When economics are bad, people tend to delay marriage to put themselves in a better financial position. When it's good, people marry younger. Sound familiar? There is the complicating factor of determining average age at marriage that men were far more likely to marry more than once than women were. So usually the quantifier used is average age at first marriage, but still. And what's more, well yes, there were far more things that would probably kill you at a younger age in the past. There's no reason to assume that a 50 year old would have been the amazing wonder of the world people assume. People do not understand the statistics. Many, many, many children died before their first or third birthdays. 50% in some places and times, which meant that the average lifespan was lower. 
However, if you survived childhood and the various perils there, including a variety of exciting and deadly childhood diseases that now we can vaccinate against, and you managed to reach adolescence, if you were a young man you stood a reasonably good chance of reaching a fairly normal age, say, 60s or 70, depending. If you were a woman, childbirth would be the preeminent danger in your life. The average level of maternal death in childbirth was right around 1 in 100 births. However, considering that many women could expect to give birth 4-8 times during their life, it would have been far more common than uncommon to either experience maternal death in the family or be close to one. So, basically, people by and large did not get married as children. Marriage age is strongly dependent on economic factors, and the advents of vaccination, antibiotics, and clean water have drastically reduced both maternal and infant mortality, along with the number of soldiers dying in war. My few favorites. Columbus sailed to prove the earth was round. No it was to find an alternate trade route to India, but accidentally found Central America. Vikings wore horned helmets. No they didn't. America had a founding based in Christianity when in fact, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson were all most likely deists. Rosa Parks was a poor, innocent old woman trying to take a peaceful bus ride home. While she was a trained seamstress, she was also a top secretary for the NAACP, assigned as an investigator for physical shaming cases. She knew full well what she was doing that day and how it would impact the country. It also is worth mentioning that the bus driver on the day was a driver who refused to let her on a bus 12 years earlier. It is also of interest that the Women's Political Council had printed flyers about Rosa Parks' imprisonment and had enough to circulate them all across the city of Montgomery in one night, urging passengers to boycott the buses. This suggests that the entire situation was planned ahead of time. In fact, I asked a few of my international friends, and most of them were taught that the incident was planned months in advance by the NAACP in order to bring segregation in transportation into the national spotlight and to create an icon that civil rights advocates could look up to. That people during the Middle Ages Renaissance were always dirty and smelly, disease and sickness was linked to bad smells in their mind, so nobody wanted to smell bad if they could afford not to, including the poor. They wore linen if they could, and most people cleaned their clothes at least weekly. Also teeth whitening was a thing during the Tudor era, and nobody ate rotten meat. This is pure speculation on my part, but high sugar diets are only a recent invention. So though they might not have had as thorough teeth cleaning as we do now, they might have not had the rotten teeth we expect them to have. Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings didn't have some great love story she was literally his flesh slave. Despite being his wife's half-sister and the mother of his children, she was enslaved until his death. She lived in damp, dark, quarters. There was nothing glamorous about her life. It's gross to me that so many people think their love was romantic. She would have been about 16 when her first child was born, and he was decades older. Lenin hated Stalin with a deep passion, and warned the entire party about his ascension to power. He even wrote in his biography that Stalin should never be allowed the path to leader of the party, that there were many other qualified, less dangerous, candidates such as Trotsky. Stalin used some of the first ever state-sponsored photoshopped images of all time to help avoid this fate. He cropped himself onto a bench, arm around Lenin, both men smiling looking at the camera, faked. Next he doctored a photo of Trotsky next to Lenin by removing Trotsky almost entirely from the image and again superimposing himself. After that, he decided to make Lenin's death into a spectacle, a martyr. Lenin absolutely did not want this to happen. He did not want his body on display for the entire state indefinitely, but Stalin yet again utilized his position to further his grip on power. He preserved Lenin's body and displayed it overtly to the state. Lenin hated Stalin, and never wanted him to ascend to power. That paintings can be interpreted literally. Paintings, just like today, take quite a lot of effort and time. This in turn means money. So no one made paintings of stuff that someone didn't want to set up on a pedestal for some reason. If you're posing for a portrait, you're always wearing your very best clothes. And paintings of events, there was a lot of artistic license. Sometimes this is obvious, but other times it's as simple as painter couldn't be bothered to paint gar lines on tents. 
but no one really bothered to paint peasant in field because, well, why would you? Canvas, oils and time are expensive, and if you're anything like half decent, you can get paid to be doing portraits instead. Yes, I take the point that some artists did paint mundane scenes, but there is still an awful lot of selection bias and downright fabrication. The photographic record is not very old, and the time of photography being ubiquitous and cheap is even younger. Also virtually all artwork was commissioned. The artist was regarded basically as a laborer. The patron was the visionary, at least until Vasari. That medieval combat involved two people banging straight swords against each other for a while until one person died. Sword fights were definitely not like that. Obviously tactics varied tremendously based on the technology, but rarely, if ever, would you swing an English longsword like a baseball bat, especially if the other guy was wearing armor. You see this in movies all the time and it would do literally nothing. When people say I can't believe that could would happen when referencing terrible acts of violence or natural disasters. Hello. It's been going on since the dawn of time. In fact, we live in one of the most peaceful times ever. The faster media we have today makes it seems like the world is ending. But hey, at least I don't have to worry about being invaded and pillaged every day. The idea of linear progression. That we never regressed and can't regress in the future. Also related to that is the idea that people in the past were dumb and that we are now smarter. The reality is that society has progressed in spurts and often regressed again for a long time in between. Sometimes one place would progress and another regress at the same time. Likewise the general intelligence level now is the same as it was a few thousand years ago. If you go back to right before the emergence of language and bring an infant back to modern time and raise it here, there will be no difference in intelligence and development to a modern child. Humans are biologically largely the same for the last 50 100,000 years at least. The only real difference is that we have a few thousand years of accumulated recorded knowledge and experience to draw on today, making us seem more intelligent. Not a historian, but I just finished reading a 900 PG biography of George Washington and he was quite a remarkable man. The misconception, however, is that Washington was the richest man in America. Yes, he was very wealthy in terms of land, but he actually had major financial problems after the Revolutionary War. In fact Washington, who had never borrowed money in his entire life, had to take out a loan to attend his own inauguration. I've never heard it suggested that he was the richest man in the colonies. I'm historian of US eugenics and genocide. It drives me nuts that people ignore the fact that Nazis base their program off of US eugenics program. When I tell people about our eugenic history and legacy, they shut down and tell me I'm rewriting history. Not a historian but it drives me nuts anytime I hear people talking about how people used to think the earth was flat. Some people still think the earth is flat. World history major with a concentration on Byzantine studies here. The whole history is boring but easy, it's all names and dates. Misconception drives me crazy. I have a very vocal discontent for how history is commonly taught. Memorize these totally true things that happened. History is stated as a fact so often that it removes any type of critical thinking to the craft. History is rarely as simple as your textbooks make it out to be. Those texts are simply one person's interpretation of the evidence presented. Give that same evidence to another person and they might come up with something different entirely. So much of history is either unknown or murky that I personally call it the greatest criminal case. We stitch together a ton of evidence, make our timeline, and come to educated conclusions. I wish someone had made this clear to me in high school years ago. When you start thinking about history yourself instead of having someone tell you it, the entire field becomes substantially more interesting. That in the American Civil War the Confederate High Command were all some kind of geniuses. It is only McClellan's scared but ineptitude in the peninsula that allowed them stonewall it. Al. To look as good as they did. They had more than their share of dipshits. John Bell Hood being the prime example. Also, that the South was winning everything until 1863 Grant coming east. Plenty of wins for the Union and the West and elsewhere before then. It all just contributes to the myth of the Confederacy as some heroic underdog tactical phenomenon. The myth comes from the overwhelmed competence of Lee, Jackson, 
Long Street TTC facing green, overly cautious or incompetent northern generals, once the north caught up in terms of experience their advantage slipped considerably. Everyone thinks Gettysburg was the most northern war, it was really the battle of Scrooge Farms. Scrooge Farms had way more DPA, deaths per acre. Yes, this drives me crazy, our education system is so flawed. This is somewhat twofold. 1. People in America especially, and even more so those who aren't well educated, think that America almost single-handedly won World War II, when, in terms of the actual fighting and dying, the Soviets did the large majority of that. 2. At the same time, amongst people a bit more well versed in history, there is a narrative, a counter narrative to what I described in 1, that the Soviets did everything, and the western powers barely helped, that is just as untrue as 1 is. The contributions of the US and Britain, as well as Yugoslavs, Poles, French, and other non-Soviet allies, should not be ignored. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe, I publish new videos every day, until then, check another video. Bye for now.